well this seems like a pretty good place to test out setting up uh, and some photography with the Inspire 2 and the X7S. <laughs> of testing out the DJI Inspire 2 with the Zenmuse 7, I discover I have 14 kilometers of cobblestone hell in second gear at an incline of about 25%. 14 k's. Haunted roads. I mean, tell me this is not haunted. Well, this seems like a pretty good place to test out setting up uh, and some photography with the Inspire 2 and the X7S. Here I'm in uh, Vidishka Mountain in Sofia, Bulgaria, and I've got a bit of property to work with, I've got the mountain to work with, a bit of sun to work with, and this view out here to work with. What's important to consider when working with a piece of equipment like this is the temperature and the conditions. So right now it's negative three degrees, but zero wind, which is pretty cool considering it's the top of the mountain. Um, and, you know, you never know what location you're gonna have to work on. And you, you know, you might be working at a ski field or a, uh, a chalet, or it might be rainy, it might be snowy. In this case, we just have disgusting slush. Now I can set the equipment up in my car. That's a possibility. The good old tech in Faklaren, it's an entire office on wheels, but I'm gonna do it out here in the nature just to kind of simulate what you might have to be up against in different situations. If you, if you are on location, you have to get done, something done pretty quick in a pinch. For comparison's sake, I'm gonna set up the Mavic and do a little bit of 4K video and a couple of full res photos just to compare both the setup time, uh, the reliability in the cold, and then to ultimately compare the quality of the Mavic camera, which is pretty good on the right settings, to the Zenmuse X7S. Not too shabby, always a bit of fumbling to get this thing set up and then now we're gonna take it for a bit of a flight. I have an ND filter on this. I've got an ND32, which I'm actually gonna take off. Um, I do have an ND filter set for this Mavic, but the ND32 has this really weird red cast. Although it is pretty extremely bright out here, so let me just have a little look. See what's going on. Got my gloves here by, uh, by Hestra. And they are particularly good for yeah, touch screens and things like that. And shooting, we're gonna be shooting at 4K 30 frames a second. I need to have a shutter speed of 60, but this 32 
and the filter is actually it's too much unfortunately I could take the ISO up just a little bit probably that'll that'll sort it out ISO up to about 400 which is not going to do too much damage to the shot shooting in 4k <laughs> And so the very important weight test. And I've been carrying this thing around a little while, just on my arm, and it was very difficult. I had to, to switch hands all the time. And I'm a guy who goes to the gym quite a lot. You know, I try to keep some strength in my upper body, but this was hard to carry. And even just holding it now, it's not so easy. So I've got the Inspire 2, the camera package in there. I've got a Sendence remote, and I've got a big, um, Crystal Sky monitor, all the batteries, two sets of batteries, uh, two sets of batteries for the peripherals. My weight was 88 kilos without this. My weight with this is 99.1. Man, that's 11 kilos. And the thing is, this is not the kind of thing that you can easily put into a backpack. I'll have to test that out a little bit later, but I think that it could maybe fit in a backpack like this. Like this one. 11 kilos is not that hard to carry around on your back, especially if you have good back support from whew, douchebag, but it's gonna be pretty awkward. So Cam, recording everything pretty nicely, a well-lit scene for this massive big box. Just so you know, I'm about five foot eight and a half. Yeah, It's a big one. It is a big fella. But it is quite comfortable to carry, it's pretty easy to work with. And I'll talk you through some of the kind of features and benefits of Mr. Inspire 2 and Zenmuse and Crystal Sky and Sendence Remote Controller as we go through this. So, top comes off like so. Propellers are up in here. It's all very safe to travel with, all these little compartments. So, <clears throat> as you can see the whole setup, it's got pretty much everything you're gonna need. Batteries, one, two, three, four. Sendence controller, massive remote control here. The DJI Crystal Sky Monitor, which is really important for sunny days and snowy days. The lens is in here, and the camera's in here, and of course, the drone himself. Here's a whole little, uh, you know, good old strappy, which you need, and then we've got a whole stack of these little things, um, little bits and pieces that help screw things together, attach things, and whatever. So we've got to run a timer. We've got to run a timer to see how long it kind of takes to assemble and prepare. Everything up until the point that I'm going to custom control, custom set up the controllers for my own experience. I'm predicting it's going to be six, maybe six or seven minutes, whereas the Mavic was about 60 seconds apart from the fun fumbling. Time starts now. What you got to understand is with the batteries, this thing has battery redundancy, which is pretty amazing. So if one battery fails, the other battery is going to take care of it and get it home. It's kind of like an airplane. If one engine fails, the other engine can get it home. The batteries come in pairs, but the pairs are bloody expensive at about 500 US dollars. And it has these insulated pads on here to keep it a little bit warm in the cold. DJI says that this guy should uh, run for about 28 minutes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Landing gear, pretty cool. In the back here, I have an SSD drive with 240 gigabytes. At this time, I've tried to purchase the license for the Cinema DNG and the ProRes, but D DNG doesn't have the ability to sell it to me, which is really weird. I'm emailing them, I'm calling them, I'm online chatting them, and still nothing after three or four days since I first sent the email. This guy's making some funny noises. I don't know why, but that's cool. All right, let's stay on with the show. Camera case, lens case, and in here we have Zenmuse with the 16 millimeter 2.8 DL mount lens already attached. So it's pretty neat, goes in there pretty safe, and I have a lot of peace of mind traveling with this on an airplane or wherever it may be. Stick it on. 
I'm pretty rough with these things as well. You know, they're designed to crash at high speed and survive plenty, so I'm not too sensitive with them. I find that if you're super sensitive with cameras like this and with Hasselblad, you're going to almost bring it upon yourself to break them. And what's good is, you know, I'm, I'm wearing these gloves, which makes things a little bit more fumbly, but I'm really not having any issues with, with fumbling. All pretty straightforward, just fumbling around. No, it's kind of weird, you know, it should be a very basic connection, but now gloves got to come off and make sure it all comes together properly. The uh, the Zen the uh, the drone is making a stack of noise here, which is good. What that means is it has a heater uh, heating the batteries and heating the internals, which is good for alpine environments like this. So for some reason, this won't connect at all. Uh huh. It's kind of somehow misaligned. It's really weird. That's interesting. So, we're having, like, it won't connect. You want it to be able to work easily out of the box, but it's not. So, obviously, that needs to connect with that, but they don't perfectly line up right now, so we've got to try to figure that out, which is just, you know, if the light is changing, if you're in the heat of the moment, you really want to get a shot, and you're working with a client, this is not the kind of thing that you want to have to worry about. All right. Uh-huh, got him reset. Good to go. That's really interesting that that's going on there. Cool, this is still not aligning. Now it's aligned. Now it's locked into place. Cool, good. It's waking up. Doesn't like being inverted. Yeah, bring him back. Bring him back. I will note as well that last night, uh, once I had all the components together, it probably took me about three hours of fooling around and uploading firmware and software and uh, synchronizing the, the Sendence remote with the Crystal Sky and making sure everything worked together properly. Especially if you, know, you always have these situations where you, you get it up into the air and then there's a firmware issue and something happens and that's not really what you want when you're risking a, a very you know, valuable financially expensive piece of equipment. Otherwise, mostly good to go. I've never put the propellers on. Let's see how that how that works. I really don't think that I'm gonna be catching this in my hands anytime soon. What DJI has done though, is they've made available these two kind of catching sticks that will go here. So it'll probably mess up the, the top speed just a little bit, but to be able to catch the drone above your head like that, it's good. However, those are carbon fiber and they go for about 240 US dollars as well. Pretty menacing looking blades here. Menacing looking blades, of course, uh, little corresponding colors. White with white, red with red, matching Alex Media Studio branding. Squeeze him in. No, doesn't want to fit easily. Either that or it looks like in this case, the blades are designed for a certain quarter. No, I wish they would just easily go on, but they don't. Add a bit more force and pressure. Nope. Come on, blade. Can you go on or not? Just gonna twist him a little bit. Hope for the best. Push down harder. Is there some trick to this? Years of experience working with drones and I just don't know how to get this thing on. All the while, time is ticking. The light can be changing. Maybe I need to push and twist to lock it in. Yeah, let's go. Push and twist. Brute force. Man, of course your hands get more cold and more irritated as you go. People are gathering around and watching. Kind of funny, it's like how many Idiots does it take to put a propeller on? One, clearly. If I actually have to stop and get my phone and Google how to put propellers on a DJI Inspire, that says a lot in a bad way. Aha, uh -huh. you gotta twist it back on itself. I see what's going on there. Now I got it. <laughs> twist it back on itself on the uh, 
the brushed gimbal motor thing. White to white, red to red. Locked in, good, good. Two out of four. Next two, as you'll notice here, my Sendence remote is now getting dripped on from above. That's not good. Now we're gonna test the weatherproofing of it all. And it's also gone into this little grill here. That's interesting. So I do, you know, I really wanna throw this at the weather and see how it responds. And usually I'd have some kind of rag nearby to dry this up, but it appears I don't. Let's just get something together here. The old fashioned technique of shirt drying. See if it's all right. I really do hope this wasn't like dripping into the top grill over here. Let's find out. Hello, Crystal Sky. Cool. He's starting up, doing things a little bit out of the order of operations, but it should be okay. And all of this setup time as well kind of stresses me about having uh, the batteries on and wasting them, especially out here in the cold and the elements. And today we don't really have any wind chill factor, but if there was, that would add again to the to the life of the batteries. DJI is good, they have two sets of propellers because it is, you know, it's always likely that you're gonna chip one eventually. And these things are pretty sensitive to make sure they're all aeronautically balanced to use some made up terminology. This is the boring part, of course, you can always skip forward to the actual flying whenever you're ready. Locked in, cool, four out of four, good, good. Cool, gloves back on for a fumbling test. See if it's not too fumbly. I had a chance to use the Crystal Sky last week with my Phantom 4 and it was stunning. But now we're up in, we're upping the stakes a little bit here with this this guy. The Sendence remote controller. And the reason why this is really important for me is because my real life goal and my goal with photography is to be a landscape photographer and the, my real buying decision for the uh, the Inspire 2 and the Zenmu 7 was the photography capabilities. Um, it looked, you know, comparable to, for example, the Sony A6500, even the Sony a AR camera, the Sony AR camera, the original. Um, and it's just a really, it was just a really, really high performance uh, sensor and I should be able to put together some pretty amazing landscape shots and get some really unique perspectives in the landscape photography world without having to mount you know, a Hasselblad onto a Matrice or something crazy like that. So what's good about this is I can control, custom control ISO shutter speed, aperture, uh, and really maneuver things and see things super clearly with this uh, Crystal Sky monitor. Now the way that it works, it just connects via USB-C from the top here to here, so no cables. This big, massive thing on the back, that is a massive radio controller, which I, for one, take much peace of mind from. Have this massive radio controller connecting to the uh, the drone itself. This operates on a 5.8 gigahertz frequency, which means it can have much better control over a longer distance. And it also has something called Globos, which helps it with global positioning system. Ugh. Get the drips out of my bucket here global positioning system um, while you're up there flying. The drone itself has sensors all over the place. And because the, because the gimbal can go really in any direction, usually you only shoot, you only fly forwards. And it has a stack of sensors here at the front, which obviously are gonna prevent it from seeing things. This little guy here is a front-facing camera. That's the cinematic camera. On the top here, we have top-facing sensors, so it's gonna allow you to fly inside safely. And on the bottom, more sensors as well, which I've taken uh, the opportunity to calibrate there at home. I don't really know how I feel about this bra thing here connecting to my controller, but, you know, Save your hand, give you a spare hand, maybe to catch the drone if you had to. That, in fact, that would actually work in a way that I've never known before. I don't really want to catch this thing ever, but I don't know how I'm going to be able to catch it if you know I'm on a moving boat or uh, something like that. Alrighty, it's time for its maiden voyage. Now, 
this thing has an inbuilt in, uh, neutral density filter, but the brightness that it is out here, I don't know if it's going to be neutral, neutralizing enough in order for me to shoot at 4K, 30 frames a second, or 60 frames a second this can shoot, um, and then get that 180 degree rule of uh, double the shutter speed. So we can just check it out. So right now, I'm trying to connect to the device. It's saying that it's not connected, even though it's been on for a while. So I'm going to start it again. Ah because the remote controller was off. Vision sensors, abnormal. What does that mean? Downward vision sensor calibration off. Well, can't help you there. So what is pretty cool about this is I'm gonna ask it to shoot in 6K, 6,000 by 3,600 or something like that. But what it also does is it records into the Crystal Sky monitor and it records a version of that 6K which is required to be recorded on the SSD, the internal SSD, into the internal micro SD at a kind of a 4K version. I'm gonna be shooting 4K 30 frames a second to compare it to the Mavic at a shutter frame of 50. This is actually 24 frames a second, um, but we'll go to 30 just for comparison's sake. Gonna have the autofocus on in this case because it should be pretty good, pretty responsive. Recording on, and now we're gonna hear what noise this thing actually makes when we start him up. So, here goes nothing. It's staying really, really, like, incredibly still. It really knows what it's doing. Let's take it for a little run. I want to show you here what I'm seeing and here I've got the scene which is really nice and crystal clear in this crystal sky and this is my forward my forward vision camera so I can see what's going on of course I've got the uh, the map down here which is great and everything's pretty damn clear lots of information the batteries are obviously pretty standard pretty generic and a couple of extra flight modes that we can talk about another time what really surprised me as well was how how wide the 16 millimeter lens was. It wasn't wide at all, it was actually kind of narrow and it gave, uh, even though it's supposed to be a super, super wide lens, comparison of about 22, 23 millimeters, it still wasn't wide enough, which is quite good for, for my purposes and that kind of epic 
landscapes and a little bit of kind of epic cinematography moving around, chasing buses, chasing cars and, and flying through relatively uh, enclosed spaces. So I'm really glad that I went for the wider one. They recommended that I get the 35, but no. Nah. Well, that was pretty damn cool, actually. I got about 20 minutes of flight time out of that without any uh, stress or hesitation. But what I completely failed to realize is that there's not only do you need to control all the eight axes of the drone, forward, back, left, right, rotate left, rotate right, up and down, but you also need to uh, control all the axes of the camera. And the camera can only spin 364 degrees one way before it needs to be kind of reset. Now the drone does have this thing built in where it can flip the drone around and keep the camera in the same place, which I need to learn how to use. But what's cool about this camera is it can really shoot up at a gradient of like 30 or 40 degrees. So you could really fly up over a hill and back down one again. And what's kind of cool is, you know, as the drone, you know, if you set it on its own path, then you can track the camera and move it wherever you want. So the, the possibilities are actually endless, but the complexities are also endless as well. That was shooting in 4K, um, and the SSD ran out of memory, 240 gigabytes at 6K after about four minutes. So that's pretty crazy. I had no idea about that. We went onto the SD, we tested it that way. So I think that's gonna come up at about 4K, 30 frames a second in ProRes or MP4. I'm not sure, I've gotta check that out back at the computer. Now I'm gonna take it up again with a different set of batteries and see how it goes for photography. Man, that temperature gets real cold, real quick. You know, this is my home. And I would love to have a, like a mate to travel with me. And I found a mate, actually, I found this dog. And he, if you notice his body language, he's really like nervous, but he wants to be friends. Oh. He's just following me. He wants, he wants a pack leader. He wants it to be me. And I want it to be him because he's like a fluffy dog. He looks pretty nice. But if I touch him, who knows what will happen. Alright, we're just on dusk here now. And it's time for the very... Oh, look at this hat. Whew, the very important uh, low light test. So the, the setting that I'm shooting on this uh, Sony a6500 is uh, completely automatic. And it's 4K, 24 frames a second, uh, shutter speed of 50 and we're getting this kind of darkness. So we are pretty dark up here. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shoot ProRes, 24 frames a second, uh, 4K, uh, and shoot it raw so that I can uh, edit it in post to, to bring out any lightness that we see. Now I think the darkness is gonna have some autofocus issues, but we should be okay. Let's go check out the skate park. I don't really wanna be too intrusive here in this park in Bulgaria. So it's pretty dark out here and I was trying to record to the internal SSD but for some reason it didn't work. Get a little bit of a crowd which is always fun and it's getting even darker. So we're going to test it now on the internal SD card and I have to do an investigation into this SSD because I should be able to record ProRes, I've got that license and all that but let's give it a go again. And this is just another example of how you can be out in the field doing a job, working for a client and then everything just goes backwards and you don't know. It's getting darker and colder and you're getting the crowd, you know, gathering around, maybe calling the police or, in this case, converting me to <laughs> Church of Latter-day Saints. You never know when they'll, when they'll come, when they'll strike. But, friendly people.
cool Christmas light glow there on the top of the drone and the remote. And okay, so what's what I found really difficult about the drone, I, I don't you gotta program in this like return camera to center button, which I thought that I did, but I didn't. And I'd like a situation where you can fix the camera still and you can fly the drone and the camera's gonna kinda stick with the drone. Right now, the camera operates completely different to the drone and you kinda need two people to operate it. So I'm sure there's a way to do that, but straight out of the box, you gotta kinda figure that out. And if you're a Spark user, a Mavic user, a Phantom user, that's a little bit tricky to kinda get your head around, but I'm sure there's a way to do it. Again, the more brilliant the equipment, the more complicated, the more education, and the more of a special skill set that you as the pilot need, charge to the client or in order to get the shot so more cap excuse me more capability and more complexity for the last part of this dji inspire 2 review with the zen muse x7 i'm going to do it here inside so you can see some of the inside lighting and i am recording on cinema dng and some of it's color graded some of it's straight off the camera this also has a cool function called uh, exposure index mode which is pretty complicated about similar to how you would develop like old film in cinema days. I need to do some more research on it, but it's some pretty advanced ISO transcending raw recording, which is pretty cool. Now, the fact that I'm recording on cinema DNG, you know, when I was in the field, I was talking about having the license, not having the license. I've successfully recorded 6K cinema DNG and ProRes without any knowledge of purchasing the license, not entering my credit card details anywhere. I bought everything uh, in this kit over the counter at a DJI store in Bulgaria, but that did not include the licenses which I always intended to purchase online because I could get it from Australia. So for some reason, this all works totally fine, direct from uh, SSD into the computer, render it in Resolve, put it into Premiere, and it also wor works raw in Premiere as well for me. So I don't know what's going on there, maybe I'm missing something, but it seems to be working totally fine for me. That said, when I was running out of space on the SSD, recording with the H265 was really a pain to work with. Uh, DaVinci Resolve had issues with it, Premiere Pro had issues with it. So even though H265 is a feature uh, to record to the micro SD card, it really wasn't much benefit, even though the picture was better than H.264 MP4 recording, it wasn't much of a benefit to work with. The Mac could preview it without any issues whatsoever, but in order to uh, work with it, it was really, really difficult. So the other things that I wanted to talk to you about was the radio line of sight. Very powerful drone, two big batteries, uh, and plenty of range and height, very agile machine, but the minute the very moment that my remote controller and this device got out of my line of sight, either with like a building in the way or a line of trees, it had to return to home. So it was overly sensitive in that sense. I know that when I fly like my Phantom and my Mavic, I can really kind of fly it around like canyons and into the city and I won't have any issues at all. Maybe for 25 or 30 seconds of flying beyond line of sight and still recording and still controlling. So overly sensitive in that sense, and I kind of expected more from this bit of machinery, both on 2.4 gigahertz communication bandwidth and 5.8 gigahertz communication bandwidth. Cool. Um, recording on Cinema DNG and the ProRes compared to the Mavic and all the other forms of recording was just insane to grade. It had all the 14 stops of dynamic range, it worked beautifully with uh, DaVinci Resolve. Uh, Premiere Pro, Lumetri responded to it really, really well. And it was just, I'm a photographer, so I'm usually post-processing landscape photography. It just responded the way that I wanted it to. There was a lot of room to work with. I could sharpen it. I could give it nice uh, Orton effects. Really, really, really cool things that you could do with uh, the Cinema DNG. And even though it was 6K in terms of width and these massive SSD uh, files, I could work with them really comfortably and smoothly without too much like lag in my system. Speaking of which, recording directly to the SSD card, it comes with, and if I can even show you here, I'm sure I've got it around here somewhere. If you are going to be recording Cinema DNG and ProRes, you need to buy this custom made DJI SSD reader. And it has this Firewire thing and a micro USB. 
and it worked really, really comfortably directly off this drive. So I didn't need to load the raw footage onto the computer. I could read it directly from this drive, USB-C, process it in DaVinci Resolve, work with it remotely off the computer, and then bring it into Premiere like with the other footage that I did before. The biggest issues with having drones, you know, you've got the Spark, the Mavic, the Phantom, and now the Inspire, is how intrusive are you gonna be when you're on location? How noisy are these machines gonna be? And of course the Mavic, it's a kind of a like a pocket rocket. It's small and it's super loud and it's got that high-pitched, intrusive, or like quite alien noise that it makes when it takes off and you know zooms around the area. And that's one of the most kind of scary and intrusive noises of all the drones. The Phantom is kind of a little bit less loud, slightly less loud, and a lower pitch. And the Inspire was an even lower pitch again, except when it was uh, descending down. So because this was a bigger, slower moving elephant kind of drone, it didn't make as much of an intrusive noise. It had a lower pitch, which seemed less intrusive. And at the same time, if you're gonna be shooting with a Mavic, you're gonna have a lot of professional equipment. You're gonna come with a case, Usually you're gonna be equipped. You're not just gonna be like a guy with a beer on the beach with your mates or hiking or something and sending a drone up in the air fooling around. When you're using the Inspire, it's not intrusive because you've kind of crossed a professional barrier and people are kind of interested and excited about a professional using professional equipment. So it's the opposite of intrusive, it's, it's professional and that's one of the big reasons why I wanted to use it. Whereas when I use the Mavic and when I use the Phantom, that is, you know, you can use it when you're at a barbecue or hiking or drinking or partying or whatever, and that can kind of cross some lines. But then again, there's the Spark, which I own as well, and that is very unintrusive, very casual, and very hard to do any damage with at all. And lastly, the photo quality. The reason why I bought this drone is so that I could take a whole new range of really interesting landscape photography, photo stitching, photo merging, high dynamic range, bracketing and things like that. And I would compare this this sensor and this camera to the Sony A6500 in terms of its photo taking ability. I'd say it's, it's even better than a Sony A6500. And I have shot with Sony and Canon and Nikon. You know what, I would actually compare this camera to the Nikon D90, which is what I first got into photography with in 2010. The dynamic range was amazing. There was a little bit of lens warping and distortion. It's not exactly as sharp as a Nikon D90 or the A6500, but it is still very, very sharp. So one of the ways that I make my money is with architectural photography, uh, real estate photography, uh, boats, uh, houses, vehicle, rental vehicles, things like that. So to be able to put this in the air, get a unique perspective, a tourist attraction, a boat or whatever it might be and to get a really amazing crisp sharp photo that sharpens very very well in post that I can control um, and that can can stretch like 12 to 13 dynamic stops. Uh, it was really really reliable for me, it was really cool and I can't wait to start putting together and post processing some pretty complicated aerial landscape photography kind of like migrating my Hasselblad camera up into the sky and doing something a little bit unique or getting down into a canyon or getting low or getting high or something that isn't done in the landscape photography world that can help me to kind of get an edge in the competition, get more you know, followers on social media and YouTube and the rest of it. So I was really, really impressed with the camera. Go to my website, www.alexmediastudio, search for the links to uh, aerial photography and you're gonna see the before and the after, the raw photos and the, uh, the process photos, which I've over-processed, given an extra saturation, extra dynamic range, just to kind of prove a point, extra sharpness, so you can learn as much about it, that as possible, because when, even though this is a 4K video, when I put those photos into this vlog, converting a photo to H.264 in a moving sense, it really, really compromises the photo that you can't really make much sense of at all. So best to see that on the website, the link is below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review. I'm gonna do many, 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 many more reviews in the future. Uh, this has been the most complicated and the first one that I've done. I'm Alex, Alex Media Studio. Like the video if you learned something from it. If you have any more questions, 
about if this drone applies for you, leave them in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe. And if you want a review of any other bit of equipment, I have access to pretty much every bit of photographic equipment in the entire world. Phase one, Hasselblad, all the drones, all this really, really cool stuff. There are affiliations that I have so I can do those reviews and give you some feedback as well. Thanks for watching, like, subscribe, catch up. Thanks for watching, I'm Alex, I'm a photographer and I live here in Europe, I travel around Europe 365 days of the year in a purpose-built mobile home that's dedicated for photography and getting myself into positions where I can get this shot every single day. And while I'm getting the shot, I'm documenting it, I'm sharing it with you here on YouTube with tutorials and adventures and history and techniques and culture and software and post-processing and gear and everything that you need to know. So make sure that you subscribe. Stay tuned because I'm gonna be speaking to you two or three times a week for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much for watching.